So I'm honored to be the first Gelfond lecturer here at UW. Tonight I plan to cover a great deal of material, and I would appreciate it if you don't believe a word I say. Instead, try to discredit everything. Consider it as nonsense. However, if you want to have healthy children and healthy grandchildren, there may be some useful concepts resulting from my remarks. So the title of my talk was Health and Healthcare, What's the Difference? In asking this question, I'll also uh, inquire as to how healthy we are for living in the richest, most powerful country in the world that spends more money on health care than all the rest of the world combined. What can we learn about producing health from Slovenia, a country that used to be a part of Yugoslavia? What's the commonest sexually transmitted infection? Finally, what is the medicine we need most in the United States? I'm going to spare you and not engage in PowerPoint malpractice, but I'll be PowerPointless, since the most <laughs> effective presentations in through, all throughout history have been done without visuals, except one in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which was said to use two stone tablets. <laughs> I'll ask you that you use your imagination to visualize the facts I'll present tonight. I'll begin by presenting my trajectory and how I came to uh, ask these questions. So I began practicing medicine in 1973 in a very different climate uh, from that present today. My clinical experience has been in three countries, Canada, Nepal, and the United States, and it's from that vantage point that I speak. I went to medical school after a brief career in mathematics because I wanted to do something unquestionably useful to society. I had come to see mathematics as a game played according to a set of rules with meaningless marks on paper. I wanted to play a different game, one of impacting human lives for the good. So after completing my training, I went to work in a community health project situated in a Himalayan valley a week's walk from the road in Nepal. That may be hard to imagine, walking, to, uh, walking a week to get to work. So I lived there and was truly on my own as the next doctor was four days walk away. Much of the time I was the only white guy or outsider there. And that experience required self-teaching and cooperation with the mountain community as I improvised equipment and treatments for neglected illness and trauma. I wanted to help Nepali doctors do more with less. So after I returned from my initial work in Nepal, I became an emergency physician here to support my, uh, my further work in Nepal. As an ER doc, I could take months or years off of work to go to Nepal and then return and get another job. So you might consider that career for the flexibility it provides. The next uh, thing, I, ha I had the remarkable opportunity to set up a remote district hospital as a teaching hospital for Nepali doctors that I supervised. Our care may have been makeshift, but we were determined to do good for our patients, and I taught by example. My Nepali doctor trainees cut skin grafts with razor blades, and did emergency surgery in the middle of the night with flashlights. My clinical motto was honed during this period, namely, don't just do something, stand there, unless it is really clear that doing something is better than doing nothing. So I came to see that medical care could harm, something that Hippocrates cautioned about millennia ago when he said, primum non nocere, first do no harm. During the 1990s, I came across data that showed that our health in the United States was falling behind that of many other nations. This is really disturbing to me as I knew we had state-of-the-art medicine and we were wealthy beyond belief. In 1976, when I returned from Nepal after that first job, a week's walk from the road, I came across a book titled Medical Nemesis, The Expropriation of Health, written by Ivan Illich who became a critically thinking hero of mine. Illich argued that medical care didn't do that much to produce health. That book was a catalyst for developing reasoning skills and led me to question important beliefs that I had not critically evaluated. In 1991, the first studies of medical harm were published as a series of three articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. That medical care could be a leading cause of death was very unsettling to me as it could cast my work as an executioner rather than a healer. So I became very confused and lost almost 30 years ago. 
As a child, I had two rather ambitious goals, especially for someone who was the son of working class immigrant parents. My father repaired shoes, my mom worked as my mother, and, uh, and as a housewife, and we lived above the shoe, store, the shoe repair store. But I was interested in what we call STEM today, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So the goals I set for myself in early adolescence were to harness fusion, the thermonuclear process going on in the sun, or cure cancer. <laughs> so what was the impact of the work I was doing? Well, I was now doing. Instead of curing cancer, I got cancer. My cancer was caused by a state-of-the-art treatment for acne back in the 1950s, namely radiate the zits. Today, we call such changes in thinking medical reversals. We thought they worked back then, but then came to recognize they harm instead of help. Similarly, such much, some of what we do in medicine today, we thought was not useful when I went to medical school. An example is giving aspirin to someone having a heart attack, which is now routinely done before you get to the emergency department. So what was I going to do? When you're uncertain, you return to school to see if you can clear up confusion. So I went to Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health, founded in 1916 as the first such school in the world. In my application statement, I said I wanted to figure out what produced health in a population and why health outcomes in the United States were not stellar. There, I learned that social and political factors influenced health the most, and medical care, as I already knew, didn't play that big a role. As to why health was declining in the United States relative to other nations, the professors were silent. No one was funding that kind of research, and that remains true to this day. We only compare ourselves to ourselves and not to other nations. American exceptionalism remains rampant throughout this country, and if you know you're the best, you don't have to prove it. So amazing accomplishments have been done in this country, which might lead us to believe we're the best at everything, except when it comes to our health, we, where we are less healthy than 35 to 60 other countries. Political and economic factors are the most important drivers of our health. So we need population medicine and population doctors to provide this. It won't be accomplished in the clinic or the hospital, but in the political arena as we people exercise our right to life. By which I mean a long life, not the short life we have in this country today. So accomplishments in the United States are astounding. During our history, we have flown the first airplane, produced the first atomic bomb and dropped two of them on Japan, produced the first hydrogen bomb, we invented the transistor, which uh, produced integrated circuits that miniaturized electronics and led to the modern computer, at, which we also developed. We landed humans on the moon. We grew Silicon Valley to be the innovative hub of the world. We sequenced the human genome. As to our testimony of our ability, we won the most Nobel Prizes, almost three times as many as, any, as the next country. That's pretty impressive. So America is great, but not when it comes to our health. As an emergency doctor, the easiest diagnosis for me to make was that someone was dead. That's hard to fake in the ER. So I take the easiest way out and consider whether you're alive or dead as the measure of health. We're all alive in this room, and I hope no one dies before I'm finished tonight. And I hope you don't shoot the messenger either. So measures of health as mortality rates are easy to come by. All you need to know is when someone is born and when they die. All of you know your birth date since you report that all the time. Most of you don't know your date of death, but others will. In the ER, I have to fill out a death certificate and write the date on it. All rich countries collect this information, as do many poorer ones, and there are good estimates available in countries that don't collect such vital statistics. So birth and death records are some of the most accurate data we have. What can, be, what can we learn from those? Well, let's begin with early life. If we take child mortality, or under five mortalities it is called, the proportion of children dying in the first five years, how does the United States do in comparison to other nations? There are many sources for this information. For example, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, or our Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, a part of our global health department here at UW. 
So take World Health Organization data for 2015 for child mortality. It puts our rank at 44th, meaning that 43 nations have lower child mortality rates than the United States. This includes all the other rich nations and some poorer ones is, such as Poland, Belarus, Cuba, and Greece. Suppose we take one of the countries with a very low child mortality rate, say Slovenia, where our first lady was born, and ask how many children would be alive today if we had Slovenia's child mortality rate. This represents something achievable. In the United States, for every 10,000 births, 65 children die in the first year of life. In Slovenia, only 26 children died during that period. Then look up the number of births in the United States in 2015 and multiply by 39 the difference in deaths per 10,000 between the United States and Slovenia. The answer is 15,513 deaths. That is the number of children that died every day in this country in 2015 that needn't, since Slovenia shows what's attainable. That works out to over 42 children dying daily, needlessly. That far exceeds the children dying in our worst school shooting tragedy. Our president sent Tomahawk missiles to Syria after seeing pictures of children suffering from the sarin gas attack there. The child death toll from that, those missile attacks was less than 42, dying every day here that needn't. So is our president killing 42 children a day in what I call structural violence? And what is the difference between structural violence and the usual behavioral violence? Well, Tomahawk missile strikes are an example of behavioral violence. Donald Trump gave the order to fire, the missiles were launched, and their destruction was obvious on the video news coverage. Behavioral violence is characterized by an action, the equivalent of pulling the trigger, causes visible injuries and deaths, and then there's the lingering smoking gun. That's behavioral violence. To be clear, our president is not responsible for the excess deaths in 2015 here. That happened on someone else's watch. We won't know the toll for 2017 until, we, uh, until later when we get the data, but I think you have the idea. Since you've all survived childhood, consider the probability of a 15-year-old girl dying before reaching age 60. That's called adult mortality. None of us want people to die in, our, in their, their prime of life. So I mentioned Slovenia, the first lady's birth country. A 15-year-old girl there has an almost 40% greater chance of surviving to age 60 than an American girl, 40%. Even a 15-year-old girl in Sri Lanka has a better chance of living to age 60 than an American girl. Same for a 15-year-old Tunisian boy. These are killer facts that can't be denied, but almost nobody knows about this carnage here. The cause is our economic inequality. Consider structural violence, the violence of inequality to be like a colorless, odorless, invisible gas that is worse than sarin. Kills us from the usual conditions we die from, heart disease, cancer, homicides, lung and kidney disease, and we're totally unaware of its existence. This could be the perfect crime, but it is not, because even the rich and powerful fall victim to this gas of inequality. That is, there's no group in this country that can evade its effects. Studies demonstrate that the rich and powerful die younger than their counterparts in other rich nations. So inequality kills them, too. So structural violence, by its very nature, is almost invisible in contrast to the behavioral uh, variety. The action that causes it relates to the economic and political structure of a society in deciding who gets what. Power relations are at the core of the actions that cause structural violence. Structural violence is taught in school when you take the Pledge of Allegiance where you state there is liberty and justice for all. With a quarter of the world's prisoners housed in the US, there clearly isn't liberty nor justice for all. Not with our being dead first, you are taught that the United States is the exemplar to the world because of its democracy, founding fathers, and moral authority. So our political system decides who gets what share of the pie. 
and we slice up the biggest pie in the world. One way to describe this pie is to look at the wealth of the eight richest people in the world. Their combined wealth is equal to that of the bottom three and a half billion people on the planet. Eight individuals have more than three and a half billion people. Who are those eight? Well, six are Americans and two live a stone's throw from here. Bill Gates, the richest person on earth, is over there and Jeff Bezos is over, of Amazon is over there. Do these eight people work much harder than the three and a half billion people and so deserve their wealth? If not, then there's not liberty nor justice for all. So th that inequity exists because of policies and processes put in place by corporations and governments. These institutions create poverty and poverty kills. I used to think people were poor because they didn't work hard enough. I've come to see that people are poor because of the conditions we create to make them poor. Like mortality, poverty can be measured in comparisons across countries made. If we take measures of child poverty in rich nations, we have the most. Almost a quarter of US families live in poverty, the highest of all rich nations. So in my quest to understand what produces health in society, I came to see that relative poverty or economic inequality was the driver of worse health outcomes. We have the world's highest paid people in the United States. These are hedge fund managers. And in 2009, one of them made $4 billion. One way to visualize how much money that is would be to take a stack of brand new $100 bills and stack them up and see how high they are. Well, it would reach to 100 feet below the summit of Mount Rainier. That's how much one person made in a year. Uh, and that works out to about $400,000 an hour. Nice work if you can get it. And in this country, we believe you can get it if you try. That's a lie. So how to measure income inequality in the world? Well, to gauge income inequality among nations, if you go to our Central Intelligence Agency's World Rankings website and click on the Distribution of Family Income Gini Index, you discover that Slovenia has the lowest inequality of the 144 nations listed there. The lower the Gini Index, which ranges from 0 to 100, the less inequality. The number of the CIA quotes for Slovenia is 23.7. And then there are 104 less unequal nations before you come to the United States, with our Gini of 45. So in a sense, we're twice as unequal by this measure as Slovenia and pay the price with shorter lives. Remember the 42 children dying needlessly every day and our adult mortality being almost twice that of Slovenia. So in my career as a doctor, I've learned that inequality is the worst killer in society. The effects of inequality and poverty begin before you're born, even before you're conceived. As an example, consider children who have had heart transplants. Children in poor parent households are much more likely to reject their transplanted heart than those in rich households. This isn't because these children get worse care or they've already begun to smoke or other explanations we might consider. The first studies done in Boston Children's Hospital surprised the investigators, so they did a multi-center study that showed the same thing. Poverty kills. Why do we have so much child poverty or any other kind of poverty in the, in the United States? Didn't we fight a war on poverty in the 1960s? No, we decided to fight a war on the poor. Let me explain, as it has a lot to do with power and democracy. So fasten your seatbelts, or there'll be some turbulence in flight. <laughs> From this country's beginnings, the rich and powerful knew they were a small number, and so they needed to control people in order to maintain their power. The Declaration of Independence said all men are created equal. They didn't mean that, but used code words so that men meant all white men. They didn't enfranchise slaves who were not human. Founding fathers did not enfranchise women either. Remember, there were no founding mothers. Men were in complete control, and they made it difficult uh, by making election day, not a holiday, but a work day. In the recent elections in France, they're held on a Sunday, 
And in most countries, in most democracies, voting day is a holiday so more people can vote. We needed a political system uh, uh, that disguised the real power base. Take our most recent presidential elections here. One party has always been the party of big business. They don't hide that. They said they believe in very little government. President Reagan said that government was the problem. We needed to do away with big government. Forget that Reagan raised the size of the government and ran up a huge debt. What matters is what he said, and that is what people believe to be true. The other party supposedly caters to the needs of small businesses and workers, or at least they say that. Now let's dissect the last election in this country. What happened and why? A little history. Since about 1970, the wages of workers have not increased in inflation-adjusted dollars. Employers said we needed to pay the CEOs more, so the workers were not going to have salary increases. We, the workers, did not protest and accepted that situation. How did we cope since we now have much more stuff, and one could argue that our standard of living has increased a great deal, as we have eye gadgets and fantastic media entertainment, as well as designer meatballs. We coped in several ways. First, women entered the workforce, and employers, uh, so families could make ends meet, and employers liked that because they could pay women less and reap greater profits. That only went so far, as we still needed more income to buy the products that were being heavily advertised to us. It became easy to not spend money, but to use plastic, and we ran up huge credit card debts. Then the economic bubble allowed many people to buy homes, even though they had no money. They pretended to live the American dream. Social spending was cut drastically. President Clinton ended welfare as we know it. You had to survive on your own as government wouldn't help you. When Reagan entered, ended low-cost housing subsidies and curtailed mental health care services, suddenly the homeless were in our face. We have the most homeless per capita of any country, and this serves our society too. So we have the highest poverty rates of rich countries and the most homelessness. As Professor Sir Michael Marmot, a social epidemiologist in England, wrote in about U.S. poverty in his book, The Health Gap, quote, this must be the level of child poverty you want. Otherwise, you would do something about it, end of quote. So how does having so much poverty and homelessness serve us in the United States? Remember that the rich and powerful number only a few. If the rest of us organized ourselves to take on the rich and powerful, there would be no contest. We would win handily. But we, the people, fear the government. Contrast this with France, where the government feels the fears the people. In the 1960s, when I came of age, we had the highest public involvement in democracy, both in the United States and in Western Europe. Voting rates here were the highest they've ever been. How did the rich and powerful feel about this situation? Did they welcome it as it showed that democracy was working? Well, the right wing has never been in favor of participatory democracy, but I would argue neither is the left. The Liberal Trilateral Commission was convened to look at the rise of democracy in the 1960s. Their 1975 report, you still only find it in Susilo, now it's on the web, it was titled The Crisis of Democracy, was very explicit. If the heated protests of the 1960s continued, it would lead to an excess of democracy, an excess of democracy. That was not acceptable, and so they called for moderation in democracy. That was the language that these liberals used. So how was this moderation accomplished? Well, big business corporations were explicit in telling us our roles were to be workers and consumers, and this has to be taught in schools. They spoke of the difficult sell job to be done, namely getting us to accept our roles so the rich would have more and we would blame ourselves for not working enough. So we accepted that the rich would become richer and we would have less. It was the perfect crime. We slashed taxes on the rich and on rich corporations. We gave them huge subsidies that came out of our pockets. The Forbes billionaire list was created in 1987 to document the stratospheric rise of wealth. 
Remember, if everyone has it, it's not wealth. It's only wealth of a few have it. So income and other economic inequality has increased tremendously whether Republicans or Democrats are in the government. It increases more in Republican in administrations, but it rises no matter who's in charge. Meanwhile, every government policy is touted as being really good for the poor. So fast forward to the present. Eight years under Bush II resulted in the huge financial bubble bursting. Rather than send the bankers to jail, as we did in the savings and loan scandal in, in the 1980s, we gave them money out of, our, out of our pockets so they could pay themselves large bonuses. The banks were too big to fail and too big to jail, and the banksters had committed the perfect crime. Then the Democrats came in with the first African-American elected president. How did he help the poor? Well, he could have prosecuted the banksters, but he didn't. Instead, poverty increased, and we had large numbers of peopleless homes because of foreclosures, as well as record numbers of homeless people. Uh, what a paradox. With inequality at an all-time high, last November 8th, there were two choices, more of the same, or something that on the face of it sounded different. When there's great inequality, how do you behave? Well, consider what George Bernard Shaw, the British playwright, wrote in 1927, quote, the woman from the brick box maintains her social position by being offensive to the immense number of people she considers her inferiors, reserving her civility for the very few who are clinging to her own little ledge on the social precipice. For inequality of income takes the broad, safe, and fertile plane of human society, stands it on edge, so everyone has to cling desperately to her foothold and kick off as many others as she can. That was in George Bernard Shaw, The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism and Capitalism, written in 19, published in 1927. So with a big gap between the rich and the poor, you're glad to have the poor to put down. You even want to kick them further below. And who are the poor today? Well, certainly African Americans and immigrants from Mexico and others who are stealing our job. Along comes somebody who says he wants to make America great again. As I pointed out, we're already great when it comes to wealth and uh, creation, technological advances and Nobel Prizes. What Donald meant was make America white again. Our country's complexion was changing. We have to get Mexico to build a wall. We have to deport Muslims. Women are getting too uppity. Remember his locker room talk. So if you're a white working male, here comes this guy that says what you hear in the locker room if you're lucky enough to have a gym membership. And if you don't, you still think that way. So he's selected president. Notice I said selected since two million more people voted for the other candidate promising more of the same. This would be impossible in France, where the election has to be, the president has to be elected by the majority of the people, so there's a runoff election that's taking place there in three days. So if the situation continues with the recently announced tax cuts for the rich, we will certainly see further rise of income inequality. If Trump carries through with having stuff made in America again, and if the US corporations have to export products, rather than import them, there'll be more jobs for Americans, but there will certainly not be higher wages. Remember, Republicans believe the market should dictate wages, and without labor unions, there'll be no pressure to raise incomes. Since Americans will be making more stuff in the USA, prices for goods will rise considerably. Since up to now, what we buy has been made in China, where they don't pay people much. So we won't have the money to buy the stuff we're used to. If we drive up American exports to other countries, they won't be able to compete with Chinese exports since our goods will be more expensive. China, meanwhile, might have even greater problems because they won't be exporting their goods to the US. That will leave hundreds of millions of Chinese workers without work. That could be the breeding ground for another revolution there. So inequality is having its toxic effects in most places on the globe. One example was last year when people in the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. And then the US election surprised the world. 
What will happen in France this Sunday could be another harbinger of the injuries wrought by economic inequality. People are responding by voting for someone who wants to limit immigration and other signs of toxicity in France. So such choices won't work in this global pandemic of economic inequality. Well, you're not dead yet, and I hope no one has died so far. You've escaped childhood mortality, and the killer facts I presented won't matter to you until you're their victim. That is why it's so difficult to get people in this country to make comparisons with other nations on their health status. The other key point in understanding health is that early life lasts a lifetime. Namely, the conditions from the time of conception to the first thousand days, or certainly before we go to school, matter more from our, for our health as adults than anything that happens after that period. So as we go from the erection to the resurrection, studies show that conditions that begin when we're conceived and end by the time we are two to five years old to determine much of our health as adults. You began life in your maternal grandmother's womb, since that's where the ovum that your father's sperm fertilized was made. So what is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the world? No, not herpes, not chlamydia, not HPV. Everyone in this room is infected. Life is the most common sexually transmitted infection. <laughs> We're all here because of a sexual act. How, are we, how we treat this infection depends on conditions in early life. So the fertilized ovum, now called a zygote, divides roughly 42 times, that number 42 comes up again, to produce a newborn. There are only five fertilized cycles of cell division to produce you sitting here. So cell division is an extremely sensitive period. If you wanted to impact it, would you pick 42 cycles over nine months or a further five over 20 years. Well, birth weight is a good measure of fetal development, along with whether you were born at term or not. And this helps us understand why African Americans have poorer health. No matter how well educated their mothers are, the chances of being born with a low birth weight are higher than for any other so-called race in this country. And low birth weight has been transmitted intergenerationally since slavery. No matter how much prenatal care these women get, they continue to have the highest rates of low birth weight and resulting health inequities. It's not fair. From an evolutionary perspective, we're here for one purpose, to reproduce and not become extinct like the dodo. The compromises we make in early life as we live in a womb with a view and see the outside world as stressful program us to modify our physiology to reproduce and pay the price later with all the chronic diseases we suffer from. First thousand days matter most for our health. Healthier nations support that period. We do not. One major problem is we conflate health with health care. We say we access health, we pay for health, we get health, we insure health. When we do nothing of the kind, we access health care, we pay for health care, we insure health care. Until we make that distinction, we will never understand health. Health care is a huge industry in the United States. As I said, we spend more than all the other nations combined on health care. In 2014, this was $3.2 trillion. That's a little over three with 12 zeros after it. A sixth of our total economy, and this industry employs one people in nine here. So what is the relationship between health and health care? Well, what medical care really does is what can be called rescue medicine. The groundwork has been laid for better or worse health in early life. You get your chronic illness diagnosed and then take rescue medicines to limit the, fat, the bad effects of high blood pressure or, or coronary artery disease or lung disease or diabetes or many cancers. We're talking about most of the chronic illnesses that will do us in. Medicine, surgery, and various procedures will only ease the wear and tear on the body until we're pushing up daisies. Recall I said medical care is one of the leading causes of death something that became evident with the first medical harm study done by Harvard University and published in 1991. 
Since then, there have been more than a score of such studies, all with similar results. If you get admitted to a hospital in this country, your chances of dying from medical care in the hospital are about one in a hundred. Such studies get reported in, for example, a 2015 U.S. News and World Report on the best hospitals in the United States. Last year, a, a study by surgeons at Johns Hopkins University said that medical error was the third leading cause of death in this country. Not happy news. So when the quarter is over and you're flying home, what if you knew that the airplane had a 1% chance of crashing before arriving at the destination? I bet you'd be taking the covered wagon. But we consume medical care with reckless abandon. I'm not saying you shouldn't seek medical care if necessary, but be careful, it might kill you. Then too, it might perform its rescue purpose. So since this talk is being sponsored by a medical fraternity, Phi Delta Epsilon, I have to be careful about trashing the work I did over most of my life <laughs> and the mission of the fraternity to do good by providing medical care. I'm not saying you shouldn't become a doctor or a PA or a nurse or a pharmacist or undertake similar careers in the healthcare industry. You just need to be aware of the limitations of healthcare. So consider a room with a sink on one side. There's a faucet there and the sink is overflowing with water. Two people in white coats, one a man and a woman, are mopping up the water, but they can't keep up with the overflow. What needs to be done? Well, clearly turn off the faucet. But that's not the job of those mopping up the water. Medicine doesn't consider what needs to be done to produce health. This wasn't taught at Stanford Junior University Medical School in the early 1970s when I was there, and it still isn't taught in medical school today. I was just talking to a student who took my course a few years ago, and she confirms that. It's not the job of doctors to produce healthy populations. It's just to treat illness and injury. Diagnosing and treating illness and injury is what medical care is all about. So whose job is it to turn off the faucet? Well, in the United States, it's not the role of public health. Public health tells you as an individual what to do to be healthy. Eat right, exercise, get your immunizations, wear a condom, and don't smoke. That is what is taught in our public health school here at UW, one of the highest ranked in the country. Turning off that faucet requires a population health approach, and no government agency in this country is set up to do that. That we're dead first and need to do something about it is not taught. So I'm a lone wolf howling about this in my courses, but otherwise there's deadly silence. So UW's created this population health initiative, but their mission is very broad and our poor health status as the richest, most powerful country in world history is not considered. No one wants to do that. So put some pressure on President Koshe, who started this initiative, to get with the program and make America healthy again. To say let's make America healthy again is meaningless unless I point out that in the early, that in the early 1950s, we were one of the healthiest nations by any measure. While our health has improved since then, other countries have enjoyed more of this miracle and their health improved faster than ours. So how are we going to get back to the relative health status we enjoyed in the 1950s? Well, in a hierarchical or very unequal society, everyone feels more stress. Stress is the 21st century tobacco. As the gap between the rich and the poor gets ever larger, there's more air rage, such as the recent United Airlines incident. Air rage increases when there is first class seating in the airplane. It increases when passengers have to enter through the first class cabin. These incidents increase air rage not only in coach class, but also in first class. Then there's road rage, which is increasing as more and more people carry assault weapons and rifles in their automobiles. We live in a pressure cooker and have among the highest reported stress levels of all countries despite our labor-saving, life-enhancing technologies and not facing the terror uh, present in other countries uh, where we attack with drones. One way to see how stress is impacting our health in the United States is to compare health during adulthood in the 45 to 54 year range. People in that uh, age bracket 
in other rich nations are seeing declines in mortality over the period 1990 to 2014. One group is seeing an increase, whites in the United States. They're dying of stress, what the researchers call deaths of despair, namely those from alcohol excess, drug poisonings, and suicides. So this points out how stress has impacted working age whites here and why they're likely to have voted for the new president. So how to change the society in which the circumstances of your birth largely determine your health? As I said, inequality kills, and it kills in early life. So we have to pay attention to the first few years of our lives. Healthier societies privilege that period, not by preaching family values, but providing time off to parent and by lessening stress during pregnancy. So how to start this country becoming healthier? The Institute of Medicine's 2013 report titled U.S. Health and International Perspective, Shorter Lives, Poorer Health, said first, tell the people we're dead first. Then look at healthier countries to see what they're doing that could be of use here. So we need to start this, this discussion to make America healthy again. How are we going to do that? Well, let's look at Slovenia. What is Slovenia doing that we are not? that produces better health. To begin with, as I said, they have the least income inequality of all nations on the CIA World Rankings website. So they have much less of the inequality gas there. They have universal health care insurance. The entire population is, sure, is insured. But that's only a very smart, small part of the process of producing health at the societal level. Slovenia believes parents should be provided time and resources to parent. So paid maternity leave lasts 105 days after delivery and 28 days during pregnancy, and the amount you get paid is the average pay in the preceding year. The father gets 90 days of similarly paid leave. After parental leave expires, one of the parents can have an additional 260 days of paid leave to care for a child at the average pay for the preceding year. In addition, the parents are given a child allowance from the government. Perhaps you got an allowance from your parents growing up. This is similar, only it is paid to the parents by the government to help raise the child. The allowance is based on the average income in the previous year. I could go on to describe the childbirth grant, child care allowances, and any other benefits that uh, everyone in the country gets, but you get the picture. People in Slovenia believe that having healthy children that grow into healthy adults is important. They get what they pay for, namely better health and lower death rates than we do. Slovenia has pre-K schools that begin at age three. All education in Slovenia is free, including all higher education and universities. There are many higher education courses taught in English, and Americans go to Slovenia for university and they don't pay any tuition just like those born in Slovenia. The Slovenian government lists all these benefits for living there on their web page, and at the top is the leading phrase, welfare state. Their welfare means faring well. What they get for this is lower mortality at all ages than we do in the United States. It's not a very wealthy nation. There are no billionaires there, while we have almost a third of the world's total. And having these billionaires doesn't buy us health. So let's copy Slovenia's population health policy since we know they work. So to begin, we need a national policy of granting generous paid parental leave at full pay. We're only one of two nations in the world without a paid maternity leave policy. And this should include a month during pregnancy. Create a national paid preschool and daycare program that begins at age three. Let's decrease the gap between the rich and the poor by going back to the policies we had when we were one of the healthiest nations. So increase taxes on the rich and then spend that on social programs, as Slovenia does. Bring Robin Hood back to take from the rich and give to the poor. It's a fantastic medicine with no side effects. Those richer will also be healthier by being less rich. Let's have a single-payer universal health care system that spends half of what it spends today. Take the profit out of health care and move to having salaried doctors who will make less. It's a big challenge. 
You're sitting there saying, I can't do that. I want to help my patients. Well, as a single person, you can't do much. Remember the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We have a far distance to go, so how are we going to tackle this together? How are we going to turn off the overflowing faucet together? I said that the invisible gas of economic inequality kills. Since we're not aware of this gas, we don't put on gas masks. Gas masks have been around since the plagues of Europe when doctors put them on to work with patients. Today, they're a symbol of horror in movies or scare tactics used by protesters or a part of street art. We can use this symbol today. Suppose all of us in this room left and got some army surplus gas masks to wear tomorrow. You would draw attention. Some people might turn away from you. Others might ask you why you're wearing the gas mask. This is your chance to tell them about the odorless, colorless, invisible, highly toxic gas of inequality that's killing us, and we're unaware of it. So gas masks can be used to foment political change in this country to make America healthy again. It's not as simple as putting on a gas mask to deal with the global pandemic of inequality as these gas masks won't protect you from it. But they're only a symbol that will allow you to draw attention to the gas, which we must do if we are to curtail the production of this deadly substance. The old saw says, if you give me a fish, you've fed me for a day. If you teach me to fish, you've fed me until the river is polluted or the shoreline sees for development. <laughs> so you can no longer fish. But if you teach me to organize, if you teach me to organize, then whatever the issue, I can work together with my peers and we'll fashion our own solution. We don't teach organizing in schools. We should be doing that in kindergarten and on to graduate school. We should teach critical thinking as well. In Texas, a proposal was made to teach critical thinking in public schools, but it was squashed as legislators said it would conflict with family values. So now that I've taken you to the brink of despair, what are we going to do? Well, we need deep organizing. If mama isn't happy, then nobody's happy. And it probably doesn't surprise you to learn that our happiness has been slowly declining in the last few decades as our power as citizens has been eroded. And the decline in happiness has been greatest in women. Clearly, mama ain't happy in the USA today. Even the first lady doesn't look very happy. Maybe she thinks she should have stayed in Slovenia. <laughs> but we're all here now. Corporate media are on thin ice, too, and afraid of falling through. Remember the Fox News debacle. Many of them are criticizing our leader. And this represents a golden opportunity to affect change. To take advantage of this critical period in, uh, in the US history, we need to go out in public and don our symbolic gas mask to draw attention to the highly toxic gas of structural inequality. Develop your speaking points. Use Slovenia as an example of a country that has better health than we do. There's plenty to discuss with others, both friends, family, and strangers. We need to fight truth decay and then organize so we're not dead first. We must work together. Put on your gas mask because we must organize or die. Thank you. All right. <laughs> question, question. I think you pushed the red button on the bottom. So either pass around the microphone or come up and. Uh... Hello? Yeah, um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to line up. It's all yours. You're speaking today uh, when the House in our Congress passed a bill, a new health care bill. Uh, the bill will uh, take $300 billion in taxes and give it back to those who earn over $250,000 a year. 
I would like you to address this bill and your topic of inequality, if you could. In other words, what I mean by that is that there seems to be a disconnect between our politicians on the one hand, most of whom in Congress are gerrymandered to either be Democrat or Republican, uh, and on the other hand, the call for equality for health. It seems likely that as a result of the bill today, if it ultimately passes, many Americans will die as a result. Thank you. So, I'm not sure I agree with you that many Americans will die as a result. Life expectancy declined in the United States from 2014 to 2015, first time in decades. Why might that have happened? If medical care is a leading cause of death, it could be because more people accessed health care. Now, I don't want to, I mean, that's really outrageous for me to say that. But, um, you know, I mentioned my cancer uh, uh, as a result of radiation. And I'm alive today because I have shunned a lot of medical treatment. Yes, in 2013, I had a recurrence that required a lot of chemotherapy. And that probably made a difference. But I've tried to avoid medical care. And the trouble is, uh, we think of medical care as the solution for so many things that it has no business messing it. You know, I had a lady come in the ER one morning at three on a Saturday morning saying she wasn't happy. She wanted to be admitted. You know, that's, that's not the role of, of, you know, we shouldn't be trying to deal with those problems. They're a symptom of something else that's happening in society. I mean, the big, tr the, you know, the disgrace really, first of all, every other rich country has universal health care. The disgrace is that most people want a single payer universal health care program. Surveys have shown this since the 1970s, but it's n remember what our previous president said, that's off the table. So even though the public wants it, it's, we're not considering it. I mean, I, I, we won't consider it until we go back and suppose we had a million person march on, on the mall in DC, or suppose we did a lot of demonstrating on May Day. I was surprised on May Day here how little demonstration there was. I canceled my quiz. It was supposed <laughs> to take place on, on, on May Day because I thought nobody would be in the classroom. We're not organizing and we're not working together. And yes, everybody should have medical care. Yes, the new legislation will decimate that. And yes, it will give more to the rich. And I'm even hearing that people think, you know, people say that, some people say that if there was an election today, he'd get even more votes. It's very confusing. I mean, he has a low, very low approval ratings. Uh, people are very concerned about everything as they should be. And the passage of this bill should be a, a huge public outcry. But I don't know if it will. That's not a direct answer to your question. Inequality is going to increase. Uh, a study is coming out on Monday showing that at the U.S. county level, things are a disaster in terms of mortality outcomes. And I don't think it's going to get better until we decrease inequality. I don't think you want to say, however, that less health insurance will mean healthier people in America. No, uh, okay. more health care insurance. Remember, okay. we can play health and health care. Sure. I, I think everybody should have access to health care without paying at the point of, of delivery. You know, I worked in Canada where <clears throat> that was the situation. Uh, and, and people just expect that that's only right. It's only in this country that people somehow think that, you know, they have to go bankrupt to access health care. It's crazy. I mean, people come from other countries and they can't believe the system here. But just as Michael Marmot said, you must be happy with the level of poverty or you do something about it. Similarly, we seem to be happy with the outrageous situation in this country, or at least we're not protesting. Thank you. Now pull it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a slightly um, different topic, but I was wondering if you could talk about medical futility, if you think that has a significant contribution to, um, to the inequality, and if you think it's a problem with how we're spending our health care funds, and if so, how big of a problem is it? And what was the first phrase? Medical, medical futil futility? Futility. Yes, so spending money on things that 
really have really low percentages of working out and people still wanting to do that because sure. they want to try every single option, but it's not really recommended by doctors anyway. Um, let's begin by recognizing we spend 20% of the entire health care budget on administration. Mm -hmm. That's an exercise in futility. Other countries spend 1% maybe. There's the number one futility. Um, people seem to think that the latest, greatest treatment is the best, even though it hasn't been very well evaluated. Why is all this happening? Well, basically it's a very profitable industry and we get the media to hype all sorts of things so people think that there are miracles happening out there when there aren't. Um, if we had an education program beginning in kindergarten in grade one, two, three, that medical care was limited in what it could do. If we had social spending, you know, uh, we don't, if you, some people say you add the medical care uh, uh, costs and the social costs together to get an, uh, an indicator of what produces health in society. We don't spend very much on social factors and so we don't have very good health outcomes. So we need to teach people that economic status and inequality and attention to early life are the major drivers. And the people are struggling to find some um, something that's going to benefit them. That said, there is a rise in integrative medicine in this country. They're actually using that phrase, integrative medicine. And uh, I just got the most recent uh, magazine, Consumer Reports. It's a non-advertising consumer magazine. And they're talking about treatments for back pain. And they're basically saying, shun all this stuff. And the experts they quote are practicing integrative medicine, do yoga, do exercise, go to see the chiropractor. I mean, all sorts of stuff that would have been heresy a while back. So we need to recognize that you know there isn't a pill for every ill or a, a procedure for every pain. And you know we can we're a very we're in a tremendous amount of pain in this country, and I think it's more psychic pain. It's called chronic pain, and consume the most opioids per person of any country. We're not even an industrial country where there are workplace accidents or things that might cause pain. It's very screwed up. I don't know. So medical futility, yes, I agree. It can only happen through, well, do what Oregon did. Oregon said we're not going to spend money on uh, you know, Medicaid money on stuff that doesn't work. We're going to concentrate it on a few things that work. And that was uh, uh, Governor Kitzhaber's plan. And... Uh, Remnants of it are still there. I mean, we could at a state level or, or hopefully at the national level, make policies that would limit what we provide in terms of medical care and help people understand that it's not gonna, you, know, you can't, can't treat things with, you know, it's rescue medicine only. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I just had a question about uh, in our current political climate and with our current institutions, do you think that the kind of change that you're talking about is possible? And then also as a future physician that's going to be working in these flawed institutions, uh, what do you think are some things that we could do on a day-to-day -day basis to try and advocate for better health outcomes? So one of the things is try to make the distinction between health and health care. Uh, you know, as an ER doc, I often had residents and people, trainees, so I would spend a lot of time talking to them about some of the ideas I've presented tonight. I've even talked to patients. And so I, I think you can raise the level of discussion to involve many more things than we normally think of. And you, you need to gain skills at that, you know, in... in in my courses, the students have to take the ideas out of the classroom, organize some community event, and present them there. They, we have to gain skills in speaking about these issues. So I practice what I said tonight when I get a marketing call around 6 o'clock, especially one that says uh, this is being recorded for quality assurance purposes, and then I can just, <laughs> I can just have at them and they won't hang up. So, 
some of the lines I presented tonight, I practiced there. You know, you can do it singing in the shower or things like that. I mean, we have to get good at speaking about this. Mm -hmm. And props help sometimes, too. <laughs> okay, thank so, you. So, practice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bezruchka, for your words of wisdom. Um, so, since we're talking about the uh, odorless gas of inequality, can you give examples, perhaps at a local level, or perhaps at least within the country, are, does the Gini score also correlate within the United States, for example, between states or other regions? So that's the first part of it. That, that way we might be able to look locally for examples. Uh, and then secondly, o over say a decade or two decades, have there been uh, examples of change over time, again, where somebody's, uh, a state perhaps has moved to more, uh, ine uh, less e inequality, where we've seen these kinds of changes that we can hold up as a beacon of hope because there is a lot of despair. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first of all, in studies of inequality impacting mortality outcomes and health, they don't tend to work at a local level. That is, you're mostly surrounded by people similar to you. So it's your absolute income that really matters rather than the gap. I mean, if you're over in Medina, uh, you know, everybody's worth millions and billions there. And that matters more than the gap between the rich and the poor in Medina. So among states, there's a strong relationship between inequality and health among U.S. states. Um, among cities, studies done uh, now some years ago uh, looked at the 282 standard metropolitan areas and mortality rates in those cities. And they divided them into four clusters, rich, middle, above the middle, below the middle, and uh, poor cities. And within each cluster, they divided them into quartiles of, any, of economic inequality. What was really interesting, that living in a poor city with a small gap between the rich and the poor, the mortality was about the same as living in a rich city with a small gap between the rich and the poor. And that was uh, when I first began to think that inequality harms the rich too. Because in richer cities with big gaps, the mortality rates are higher. Um, as to sort of local levels, I mean, Right now, uh, in, at UW, they're trying to look at the impact of the minimum wage. You know, we've raised the minimum wage here, and they're trying to see if this is going to have an impact on, on health. Um, I think it's, it's problematic because it has to start, you know, if half of our health has been programmed before in the first thousand days, there is a lag effect until the inequality affects our society and it works through uh, that er early life period. Um, Are there uh, proximal indicators, though, that uh, we can look at? So if there have been changes over time in a certain state or region where we can say we don't know what this is going to do in 80 years uh, to mortality, but that these are certainly good indicators that uh, things are improving as far as access or yeah. other things like that. Things are improving mostly in the rich counties. There's a study coming out on Monday, as I said, and uh, mm. rich counties are doing better and poor counties are actually doing worse. Mm -hmm. We take, uh, so, you know, the disparity, the, I don't like the word disparity, it, uh, but the inequity, the unfairness of the health of, has reached, has, has, has a greater breadth of more than 20 life expectancy years uh, between the, healthiest county and the least healthy county. And that is due to the gross inequality in the country, but um, the paper's gonna say it's due to behavioral things and medical care. <laughs> and that's gonna be published where, this report? Uh, JAMA Internal oh, Medicine okay. Great. On, on Monday. Yeah. I got a, an advanced copy. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for your talk, doctor. Um, I, th I was really interested by your point about teaching critical thinking to children at younger ages. Um, and I, th I think it's really relevant because in order to make large changes like the ones you're talking about, we're going to have to mobilize a lot of people. And 
I think a lot of people here are, we're here because we are critical thinkers and it's easy to talk to people who are critical thinkers by using logic and examples and reasoning. And I was just wondering how can you encourage other people who are afraid to step out of their comfort zones or their, um, their homes and, ex and really observe what else is going on outside of their individual lives? How do you talk to some buddy who lives like that? Well, like I said, start practicing with the marketing calls. Um, <coughs> but you know, talk, find people who disagree with you. And, uh, and then, you know, engage in a discussion with them. Um, as you're asking this question, I was reminded, so I, I try to get involved with many different groups of people to see how, how, what they think and why. So I was once in a grade eight class, actually it was a private school in the Seattle area. And, and, uh, um, and I was talking about some of this stuff and they looked really confused. And so I stopped and I said, how do you come to know something is true? I said, nothing, there was silence. Normally you're uncomfortable with that silence, so you break it, but I stood the silence. Finally, a boy raised his hands and he says, if our parents tell us when we're very young, if our friends and teachers reinforce that, and if we've experienced it, then we know it to be true. So early life exposure, reinforcement by people that you uh, respect or know, and without experience, it's really hard. So how do you get experience about mortality rates? That's the tough part. I, I think the best thing you can do is go to other countries. Remember, uh, you know, we, we have very few people who do international travel in terms of passports and things like that. And uh, Seymour Martin Lipset said, a person who knows only one country knows no country. We can only understand ourselves by seeing ourselves from different perspectives. So talk to as many people as you can, find speaking points. You know, you can draft an elevator speech. You know, you're stuck in an elevator for 30 seconds. What can you blurt out in those 30 seconds? And you know, you, I've been kind of hard and strident in presenting this material here, and I don't know how well it, it sort of went over, but in the process of talking to people who don't agree with you, you might be able to communicate some sense of trust or respect for one another. You have to respect their ideas so they will respect yours. It's not a, it's not a one size fits all process, but um, getting in, Getting to talk to as many different people has been a, a really exciting part of, of making this uh, uh, valuable for me. You know, homeless people in the Pike Market uh, soup kitchen, uh, a grade eight sex class in Hood River, Oregon, um, homeless, you know, just a variety of people and you develop speaking points. But you gotta want, you know, so what are you gonna do? You gotta do something that you enjoy. If you don't enjoy it, you won't do it for long, something you have skills at, and something you can do without getting paid, because there's no job category in this country try, and that will pay you to make this country healthy again, I'm afraid to say. Thank you. Um, we're actually coming um, towards an end, so I'm gonna have to close down to questions, but definitely come and grab Dr. Berzuch. There's roots go. It's a tongue twister for sure. Um, at the end. Um, can we please get another round of applause? Before I end, I'd like to recognize some people that have worked hard to help plan this event. Um, could the members of FIDE -E Gale Fund Committee please stand? These individuals have worked hard the last few months to plan and execute this amazing event and deserve a round of applause. I'd also like to thank the rest of Fight E Washington Alpha for helping spread awareness for the event and creating the beautiful posters that um, are against the back wall. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and attending. And most importantly, I'd like to thank Dr. Bezruchka for taking time out of his schedule to help educate us on the difference between health and healthcare. 
Um, as a token of our appreciation, we would like to present you with this plaque and flowers to commemorate this auspicious occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Last few words. Get out and organize. Talk to other people. And uh, my email is easily available. You know, share what you've learned with me and uh, you know, consider taking my courses that you, in which you gain skills for doing this. So thank you for your attention. It's really been a pleasure. <laughs>